Holy Moses, my mind's gone blank. Was it two steps forward, then another back? It seems unfair of me to call it his. All I know is it would start... Welcome to this week's Scots in Us podcast, the young distilleries of Scotland, number one in our series. We're going to be joined this week by three distilleries whose path to the world market is underway. And we're also going to begin by talking to Martin Green. He is the global head of whiskey for Bonham's Auction House. And he is going to be telling us about the upcoming auction in March, but also about some outstanding whiskies, only 40 years old, that are already commanding hundreds of thousands of dollars. It is really a collector's market and maybe some of the whiskies we're going to be discussing today fall into that. We're going to then turn to Lindor's Abbey, the home, they say, of whiskey. It is 400 years since they produced their last whiskey there, and that is now underway and about to be available in the United States. So we catch up with Drew Mackenzie Smith, who is the founder and owner of the wonderful Lindor's Abbey Distillery. We then journey to the Isle of Harris, and we meet up with Simon Erlach, who I last spoke to about 10 years ago as he was putting together the dream of getting a distillery underway in Harris. It now is happening. They have a wonderful gin that's being produced, and we're going to hear about the whiskey that they have already laid down that soon we're going to be enjoying. And then we catch up with our Becky who have been for the last six years producing some wonderful award-winning gins and vodkas and now have a whiskey, rye whiskey underway. We're going to be speaking to their Alex Forsyth, who is a US brand manager. And so now let us begin by speaking with Martin Green of Bonhams. Centuries past and the clan of Duncan his dance was handed down. And now I'm delighted to welcome back Martin Green, who is the global head of whiskey for the Bonhams Auction House. Welcome back, Martin, and thank you for joining us again to tell us about the upcoming March 2nd whiskey sale at Bonhams. I'm delighted to be here and thank you for having me. Well, you're coming off what was a wonderful auction in December when you had a Macallan go for over six for 68 thousand pounds i believe and coming up on march 2nd you have a lineup of great whiskies once again before we get going though could you clarify the age of these whiskies what is the term um an older whiskey because i see that some of these are around 40 years old 25 years old they don't seem extraordinarily old but maybe if you could put that in context first okay so um the bow moors for example that that we talk about are were all matured for 40 years plus um the significance of the age is that the after that period of time the condition of the spirit is good enough still to bottle and still very good to drink. And, you know, not every cask that is matured for 40 years plus will be good enough um, or will be considered good enough by the industry that will meet their expectations of, of what they would actually bottle and sell to the public. Um, but the, you know, these, the Bowmores, for example, um, are really excellent whiskies, both for drinking, they're obviously highly collectible as well, um, you know, very, very good spirits. And you've got a Bowmore trilogy, which you're expecting to go for around £55,000. Yes, indeed. Well, that's three bottles. Um, the Black Bowmore, uh, a 42-year-old, um, distilled in 1964, which was matured in ex-Oloroso sherry casks, which is what gave it the colour which is why it's so dark and that's why they called it Black Bowmore. The White Bowmore was matured in ex-bourbon casks. Um, that's a much lighter whiskey, which you will see from the photograph, um, which again is, is why the distillers 
gave it the name because it is lighter in colour. And then the gold no more, the 44-year-old distilled in 1964, was matured in, in ex-bourbon and Oloroso sherry casks. So it's, again, slightly different in colour. Um, but again, a, a whisky distilled in 1964. So the, the three of them in that lot are all 40 years plus in age. And I noticed that in the sale, you have some decanters. Limited yes. decanters. And they look absolutely stunning. So um, can you talk us through these opportunities? Okay, so there's the, um, the Dynasty decanter, um, which is filled again with a with a Bowmore. That wasn't bottled by Bowmore distillers themselves. That was bottled by um, an independent company who are based in Glasgow called Hart Brothers, who are very well considered in, in, um, in, in the whiskey business. Um, you'll see that there are various medallions um, which are in relief on basically a solid sterling silver casing that goes round the Atlantis crystal decanter. Um, the, the Atlantis crystal decanter was manufactured in Portugal, um, but those various medallions represent the kings of Scotland and Mary Queen of Scots going from uh, the period of 1406, um, James the I, um, right through to through Mary Queen of Scots, and finally James the um, Sixth to 1652. So they're they they represent uh, the, the the Scottish monarchs. So we have the decanters from um, Beaumont, and then we have the Glenmorangie decanter. Yes. As well. Glen Morangy. Oh, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> to give it its proper name. They called it Glen Morangy Pride. It's a 28-year-old spirit that was distilled in, in 1981. They only made a thousand of these. Um, this is quite an interesting presentation because the decanter is it's mounted into a mechanism, which when you close the, the, the wooden outer part of the case that encapsulates the decanter inside it. So it's a very slick mechanism. Um, it's a very beautiful thing and, and, and again, very popular. And that one, there were a thousand of them made. Yes. Good limited uh, edition um, and around 3,500 pounds. Yes, uh, that's sort of the price that they tend to fetch in the region of 3,500. That's wonderful. Um, <clears throat> and then we have the Macallan 25 euro, which is, again, yes. a reasonable amount, but a very collectible whiskey. Yes, well, the, the one that's illustrated there um, was distilled in 1958. Um, it, it's part of... Um, I suppose the, the early vintage releases that Macallan produced, um, bottled back in the 1980s, um, very collectible because obviously they're not produced in that livery anymore. In the early 1990s, Macallan changed the shape of the bottle, design of the label, presentation case, that kind of thing. Um, so, you, you know, you won't see that, that type of bottling coming out of the, st the distillery now, um, but the fact that it was produced all those years ago um, is what is the attraction. That's what makes them collectible. And in your listing, I see that there's Port Ellen casts of distinction. Are yes. these actual casts or bottlings? Well, the, no, this was a... Um, this was an initiative which um, Diageo introduced where um, someone could come along and buy a cask, a whole cask of whiskey, um, basically with a view to having it bottled. Um, the distillers would arrange the bottling of it. Um, in this particular instance, is bottled in crystal. Um, in a beautiful presentation case, they're, they're, that cask in particular, only yielded a total of seven to eight bottles. So it's very rare. These are not available, generally speaking, for the public to buy. So when one of these comes up for sale, it would generally come up at auction rather than a retail outlet. 
So whiskey is becoming a real collector's market. You're doing, is it four sales a year now? Yes, that's correct. We do four in Edinburgh. We do two in Hong Kong. We also have the odd online sale too. Um, so there's a, a lot happening at Bonhams with whiskey. And people can reach out to you with anything they've discovered in their cabinet that might be surprising. Indeed, yes, they can. Um, they can go straight on to the Bonhams website and they can go through to the, um, through to the departmental page to whiskey to request their evaluation with images. Um, Bonhams also have representatives all over the United States. So if, if you had something you were looking for advice on or for a value, whether it's for sale or, or not, um, you could contact your local Bonhams representative or you could come straight to me um, at Bonhams or submit an ordinary valuation of the item and we would get back to you. And it's not difficult to bid either, you know, to go on, register and bid is very straightforward. It is, you know, you can be sitting in an armchair at home with a laptop or a tablet, or you can quite frankly now do it on your phone through the Bonhams app. It's extremely accessible for anyone all over the world, um, which is where, you know, a lot of our inquiries come from and where a lot of our buyers are. Um, our, our buyers are truly global. Well, I think it's wonderful to hear the updates and to know how healthy the market is. It um, is I, very healthy. I heard today that there was a, like a, a jump up when COVID and the restaurants reopened last year of like 30% of the restocking their whiskey. So that gave the whiskey industry a good kick as well, which was nice to hear after the terrible time we've had indeed. coming through this. Yes, yes, indeed. So thank you for joining us again. And we'll catch up with you soon to hear more about what's in store for us. But for now, thank you. And March 2nd, the Whiskey Auction at Bottoms Edinburgh. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Call her learning it anew. Then came Arabella Inches, a fearsome woman chief. Not a chink in her armor, set in her left ear, she was... Deep. Drew, good morning. I am so delighted to be able to catch up with you once again. It's been such a strange year yet again. Um, but I'm really looking forward to hearing the news from the Abbey. Well, it's lovely to see you again. As yeah, we're, we're coming out to the end of what has been a strange time over here, I suppose. that we're, I'm more fortunate than most that during lockdown... We have the Abbey and we have a distillery with a bar in it right over the road. So, yes, it was a, it was a, an interesting time. But but the timing of this is 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 very good, because when we were chatting last time and I was saying the plans we had for, for the Abbey, which at the time were just plans, but the, the physical work, the important stuff started last week. That was the very first of potentially about a seven or eight year program that we're doing in conjunction with Historic Environment Scotland. So that's it's a real big thing, because actually the Abbey, we had to close it. I mean, there's, there's nothing good about lockdown or COVID, but ironically, the Abbey was closed for most of that because, you know, I invited Historic Environment Scotland on site and I suppose they were slightly horrified, you know, we just take it for granted, but they were slightly horrified that I'd been letting everyone in through these 800 year old gates without a care in the world. And they were a bit worried that stones might fall on people's heads, things like that, which fortunately never happened. Uh, but it, it, did, it did necessitate um, the getting experts on site. And, and the, what's slightly ironic in a sense that these loose stones that could have fallen and they, they would have been dangerous but the the way of fixing it is about as ancient i it looks about as ancient as the abbey itself because what what it now looks like is where where there were stones you have a a wooden stake right. holding up the stone above and two wooden wedges holding the stake in place which all sounds a bit kind of medieval but uh, I'm assuming they know what they're doing and so far because we've had terrific storms here um, I mean 
not as bad as I think you guys have had some pretty hellish weather, but the wind has been horrible. And so far, all the stones are in place. But it's, it's really nice, though, that we've, we've begun the process. And then it's going to be six weeks a year of continued um, conservation work. So it's really nice that that's actually beginning rather than me just talking about it. But this, to go back a little bit, because not everybody may have watched our wonderful no. segment with you, Lindor's Abbey is producing the first whiskey in over 400 years. And mm. it's just about to get launched. And this is now recognized and spoken of as the, you know, the home, the very first home of whiskey in Scotland. Yeah. yeah. And so it's it's wonderful. So the Abbey, if you could just explain a bit about the history to the Abbey and the monks. Sure. And how that's all come to be. Well, it's the, the abridged version, because when I stand up to make a speech and I say, well, it all started in 1191, I can see people's eyes glazing over because it'll take, it'll take a while. But no, the Abbey was founded by the Earl of Huntingdon in 1191, and he was a brother of the King of Scotland. And he used Tyrannensian monks who came from France to, to build the Abbey. And it was a very powerful, successful monastery up until about 1580, where sadly it fell foul of, of John Knox and his merry men and the dissolution of the monasteries. And they, they pretty much pulled it down. So what we have now is a very, very pretty historical ruin. Um, where, where I come into it is my grandfather, sorry, my great grandfather bought the, the land that the Abbey sits upon, the, the farm, back in 1913. So we've been here for over 100 years. And the Abbey itself has a huge history encompassing William Wallace. It, it, there's a lot of very, very important aspects of Scottish history that happened at Lindores, and that's very much a driving force for us preserving it. But, but in a way, the reason I'm sitting here now in my office looking at Lindores Abbey Distillery and looking out the other window at, at the Abbey itself, is a tiny segment in the Exchequer Rolls of 1494. The Exchequer Roll was the King's tax record. I've had the privilege of seeing this actual document. It sits in, the, in Edinburgh. And in the middle of this 30 yard long document on vellum is one little line written in Latin and it's barely legible. But what it says translated is to Friar John Cor, eight bowls of malt wherewith to produce aquavitae for the king. Now, aquavitae became uscobar, became whiskey, and that was the earliest written reference to what is now Scotch whiskey. We were blissfully unaware of that, <laughs> completely had no idea of any whiskey link. We knew about William Wallace, we knew about all the other things. And then 20 plus years ago, a gentleman turned up at the door and asked my father if he could wander about the Abbey ruins. And my father said, feel free. He thought it was slightly strange. It wasn't something, it was just our back garden. Um, and thought no more of it. And then six months after this, a, a lovely hardback book arrived in the post called Scotland and its Whiskies. And the chap was called Michael Jackson, who sadly is no longer with us, but he was the leading whiskey and beer writer of his day and he said in the inside it said dear ken thank you very much turn to page 127 i think it is and on page 127 there's a lovely picture of of the abbey ruins a lovely photo and the chapter begins for the whiskey lover it is a pilgrimage and he, he goes on to talk about walking around the monastery saying a, a silent but happy saint dionysian prayer to Friar John Corr of Lindor's Abbey. And that was genuinely the first we knew that there was any whiskey history here at all. But that was also the spark that led to me. My father sadly since passed away, but that was genuinely the beginning of the journey that it, it didn't end when our whiskey came of age, it kind of begins again. So we yes. now, after all those centuries, Lindor's is producing 
whiskey once again. So it's, it's an exciting time for us. Well, we've been in touch with you for a few years now. Mm. Because when we, I first read about what you were doing, it was such a wonderful, you know, news. And um, so, and you you have a restaurant there with gourmet food because you love food. I, I think you're a chef. I do too much right? is evident. <laughs> And, and now people can visit, they can yeah. do events there. Yeah. And very shortly, you will have news that we will be delighted to share with everybody when we can, that we're going to, the whiskey is going to be available over in the States as well. Exactly, which, it, which is huge for us. The States is obviously a very, very important market for us to be in. Um, and we're very much looking forward to it. We're, we're in, in advanced conversations, so it, it really will be in the not too distant future. The, the other exciting thing, which I didn't know when we were last chatting, that I probably mentioned that we we, we didn't do a gin, we brought out our aquavitae, yes. which is like the origins of whiskey, but probably nicer than it would have been <laughs> 500 years ago. Um, so that was nice and it's doing very well and it's for sale in Canada and all over the place. But what, again, a bit like being blissfully unaware of the whiskey link, we had a, a, a lady contact us a little while back now and she's part of the, um, I'm not sure what the proper title is, the Sisters of the Mayflower, Sons of the Mayflower. Anyway, in, in, the, in the list of what was on the Mayflower, is Aquavitae. Now, I'm not saying it was Lindor's Aquavitae, but it's a really nice link for us that, again, you know, Lindor's is a, is a funny place. I suppose because it's got so much history, it's amazing what, what, what percolates to the top, but it was really nice. And this lady and her husband, I think they may be both members and they've, they've bought, we managed to get them some Aquavitae and sent over glasses and things like that. So it's a really nice link. So when the whiskey arrives, we'll make sure there's some, some aquavitae hot on its hot on its tail. Good. Yeah. Well, we're looking forward to all that. We um, are so glad we could talk to you. Maybe next time we're doing a series on the distilleries because the last our first one with you was so popular. Um, so maybe we can catch up with you in a few weeks, months time to hear about the launch and maybe see how the towers, the Abbey Tower is coming on. Absolutely. I, you see, you're talking as the farmer. This is your home. Who would have thought that arch would fall on somebody? I can't. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm glad that the health and safety people have taken care of you now. <laughs> yes, they, 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 do, they do have a job to do, you know, and, and we really ap appreciate that. And they're helping guide the way forward, you know, because obviously it's a very delicate job doing these repairs, etc. You have to do it the, the correct way. Yes, and um, we'll talk about that a little bit next oh, time cool. because we um, are working, you know, and in touch with several of the historic building uh, people and I think that's such an important element. Have a wonderful rest of your day. I hope the winds aren't too strong there so. <laughs> and we look forward to catching up soon. Take Excellent. care. Excellent. I look forward Take to it. Bye. 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 And so the day came for the chief to learn the steps. Her predecessor spoke them in his final dying breaths. Simon, good morning to you. I am so delighted to be able to talk to you this morning. Uh, you're in Harris, I believe, at this moment. It's a long time since you and I were in New York together um, at the beginning of this journey for the Harris Distillery. Hello, Camilla. Yes, yeah, lovely to see you again. A great pleasure. And yes, indeed, I'm um, sitting in my croft house in the south of the Isle of Harris at the moment. Um, battled the uh, 90 mile an hour winds yesterday to get over here by ferry from the mainland. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's, it's extraordinary to think that it's, uh, it's almost 10 years ago, I think, since we met. We came over for a few days, we stayed in Brooklyn. And we came to your place, as you recall, and had a delightful um, early evening drink and a, and a presentation of our uh, of our project at that point. This was very much at the early stage when it we was very, very embryonic. Um, totally. 
and Alan, uh, who is our former chairman, so people understand, um, loved trying to take things forward and loved the Isle of Harris and Lewis, etc. The um, and so it was wonderful hearing the concept. But your background was whiskey and understanding what that was all about. So perhaps if we go back another step and you could tell us a little bit about yourself and why you have this love of whiskey and how the idea for the distillery came about. So yes, a, a few years in London, I moved out to Switzerland when we bought a Swiss subsidiary and I ran the sales and marketing operations for what eventually became Diageo. Uh, back in those days, it was Gordon's Gin and Johnny Walker and, and a bunch of other whiskies. I then came up to Edinburgh, actually, in 1993, when I was headhunted to work for the Glen Morangie Company. So I then became commercial director for Glen Morangie, based up in Tain, uh, but living and working in Edinburgh. Um, we bought a distillery on Isla called Ardbeg that the... Uh, oh. local <laughs> Pete Freaks will be, will be, will be well, well uh, used to. Um, and had 15 fantastic years at Glen Morangie. Um, we sold the company to uh, Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy uh, back in 2005, I think it was. 2008, I decided that that was probably the end of the fun and that enjoyed working with the French, but it was time to move on. So I went solo for a while and started doing a bit of consulting work for niche startup whiskey distilleries. And it was during that time that I was approached by a headhunter in Glasgow who said that he'd got the, a, a quite an extraordinary brief from uh, a gentleman who didn't know anything about the whiskey industry, but wanted to create the first ever legal whiskey distillery on the Isle of Harris. So as you can imagine, jumped at the opportunity. And this was back in May, 2011. But you know, it isn't a quick thing. Uh, you know, number one, to produce a whiskey takes many years because it needs to, I'm going to probably use the wrong word, mature. Right. Uh, and you that's why so many gins and vodkas occur ahead of that. But also you had to build the distillery and get all the permissions and work the whole thing out. So how long did that phase take? How, was it difficult, that next phase, before you began the distillery yes it was it was a real challenge because we have no money um we had a we had a concept uh we had a, a we, we created a business plan but we realized that building a distillery on harris if you want to do it really well which we did was going to take a lot more money than most people would necessarily want to invest and therefore there would be a gap and we would need help so we spent nearly two years, we traveled Asia, Europe, and America looking for the right kind of investor, people who would be interested in doing something, not just for a return, but also for the, the pleasure of getting involved in something like this project. But at the same time, we were lobbying Scottish government uh, for public support. And we were fortunate enough to pull together over a couple of years, 18, like-minded investors with this viewpoint that we were looking for. And we got some very substantial grant funding from a European fund administered by the Scottish government, um, but also Highlands and Islands Enterprise, the local enterprise agency stepped up to the plate and then filled the last gap that we needed. It was about 11 million pounds that we were looking for, uh, which, is, which is a lot of money when, when you know, you're building a whiskey distillery in a remote location. Uh, but but I was going to say, it's lovely to hear that the Highland Fund, Highlands and Islands Fund helped you because the Highland Fund was started by our founder, the ASF, Lord Malcolm Douglas Hamilton. Oh, right, of course, absolutely. And, and yes. so he wanted to see businesses yeah. such as yours happen and to give back to the local economy and help with that. So that's, that's even more important to us. Well, I should say the reason we got all this assistance was the purpose of this distillery is highly unusual. I think we're the first distillery in Scotland created primarily with the purpose of supporting economic regeneration. So we exist with the aim of turning around 
50 years of population decline in Harris. That's what we're here for. And that's what makes it so incredibly exciting. But I hear that so much when we, we were talking to the Scottish Salmon Company and the community element of what you're doing is so vitally important. You know, it's not that you're just, you know, making a product, it's how you're helping and growing the local community. Absolutely, exactly. So we promised uh, the, the, the funders that we would create 25 jobs within five years. So we opened up doors in October 2015. Uh, so we are just six, just over six years old, and we now have 40 people working in Harris. Everyone who's at, all of our distillers, we have a whole team of distillers of whiskey and gin, none of whom have ever distilled anything in their lives before. They're all islanders who have learned their craft from our consultants and advisors who help these people to learn that to learn how to distill from scratch. So this is what's really exciting. We're creating new talent, new new expertise on the islands that's never never existed before. And the products that are being used to make the gin and the whiskey come from Harris. Well, to be honest, Camilla, that's very difficult. There is no arable land on Harris. All right. So we, we cannot grow the barley that we need to make the whiskey. So that's brought in from the Black Isle and in Venetia. Um, and it's and the water. It's the water you're using that the makes water, the difference. The water is ours. The water is ours. Yeah. And that's pretty special. We actually have, we believe, chemically speaking, the softest water of any distillery in Scotland. It comes in from you guys across the Atlantic. It lands on three billion year old Louisian gneiss, which is a, which is a granite, which is totally impenetrable. So the water doesn't collect any minerals when it flows over the rock. And then it, land, it arrives in a little reservoir in the hill above the village where we distill and we pipe it down into the distillery. So we have this very special water. And the other thing we do contribute, I think, which is incredibly important, is the climate. Yeah. So as I said, 90 miles an hour gales flowing in yesterday. Today it's sunshine and showers and there's a constant changing climate in the house, which is going to create a really special single malt whiskey nothing you can quantify but we know that those elements that what the french would call the terroir <laughs> are, are going to contribute something special to the single malt that we're producing now when will we be able to taste the first single malts from you well we currently have in our warehouse in harris about five thousand barrels of whiskey that we've been filling since we started in 2016. Every year we've been sampling quantities from these casks. So about 50 barrels a year get taken down, a small type sample taken yeah. out and tested. So we've never said a specific date when we would launch. We've always said life takes time and the whiskey will be ready when it's ready. So we don't want to be beholden to some date or some age. But the good news is we are really excited about how it's developing. It really is maturing beautifully. That climate that I spoke about has, is doing its job as we hoped it would. And we're using the best casks we can get our hands on from selected places, particularly particular distilleries in Kentucky uh, and one or two in Spain as well. Because that, so, gives, the, because that gives the richness and the flavor that comes through in the whiskey as well, from the cask and the, the different oaks that you're using. Every element, every element we put into this has its influence, whether it's the malted barley and the level of peating that goes into that, whether it's the water, the climate, the, the handmade process. I mean, the fact that these distillers are Harris folk and it's all a manual process. We don't use computers. So that will have an impact on flavor. The long fermentation times, we, we ferment our, our barley for about three to five days, and then the cask itself, and that cask will also contribute. It's very important, but what we always say is there's no one thing that makes the, the big difference. It's a combination of all of these factors. So I'm not really giving you a straight answer to your question. <laughs> And that's because we're coming close to launch, but we're not absolutely ready yet. It won't be this year, but it won't be long after that, I'm pretty sure. 
But the thing is, it's not as if we're not seeing wonderful product from the Harris Distillery. You have a fantastic gin, and which has been really um, promoting you, amplifying everything you're doing. Um, when did you launch the gin? Well, yeah, it's kind of you to say so. I mean, the, the gin we launched as we opened the distillery in September 2015. But the, the funny thing was we didn't have huge ambitions for the gin. We thought it would be really important to make one because we wanted something for the visitors to buy when they came to the distillery. Um, and we wanted something to help us to establish a reputation so that when the whiskey came along, we'd already done that. So we didn't have massive ambitions, but within literally weeks of launching the gin, we realized we had something very special on our hands. And we're now selling in 24 international markets and um, we are working flat out to keep up with demand. So it's been a fantastic success, way beyond our dreams, so much so that we've actually expanded our whiskey making capacity in right. order because we've been able to generate the money from the gin to afford to do so. So obviously with whiskey, if you don't lay it down today in the warehouse, then it won't be around to sell tomorrow or in a few years time when it's ready so that's the thing that every whiskey company dreams of is being able to lay down more stock uh, so that they have uh, barrels waiting for future sales i think harris is a great brand the island of harris harris tweed harris people the the cross you know i think that that really helps with understanding and connecting to the brand of Harris Distillery. And I love your bottle that you have just over there that we will put up on screen. Um, but just in closing, because I do look forward to talking to you again, we're doing a whole uh, series on the distilleries of Scotland, um, especially the small up and, com up and coming new distilleries that are coming along. Uh, and so I'd, I'd love to return to you and maybe talk more about um, cocktails and different things we can do with everything. Um, how can we get hold of a bottle of gin right now? Harris Distilled Gin in well, the United States. In the United States. Well, it's only been nine months since we arrived in the States. We took a long time to get that right. We wanted to choose the right partner. And we know it's such a big market, such a complicated market. So we, we launched in May last year. So we are now in 11 US states. Right. From Texas, California, Illinois, New York, Massachusetts, Arizona, Louisiana, Georgia, Colorado, Oklahoma. There we go. That's the list. Um, we are not going to expand any further. We want to consolidate where we are at the moment. But if you go to the harrisdistillery.com website right. and the US flag in on the website, you'll be able to find uh, your local stockist. In, in whatever state you live in, if you're living in one of those 11 states. But it's going fantastically well. Uh, again, beating all of our expectations. We've had, we keep running out of stock in the US because it's selling so well. Uh, so we're absolutely delighted with how that's gone. And uh, as I say, it helps us to establish the brand, uh, the Harris brand, the Isle of Harris gin brand. Um, and, uh, and when the whiskey is available, hopefully that will do equally well. Well, we really look forward to catching up with you again in the coming months. We are very excited to be involved and able to keep going with this, the journey with you. And, it, and we're not going to leave it as long between our visits. Oh, it's fantastic, Camilla, <laughs> to get back in touch and to come full circle 10 years later and oh. to work with you again. Isn't that wonderful? You I helped us on our journey at the beginning, and now you're going to help us again on our journey now that we're at the next stage of it. So it's brilliant. And also, it shows how your determination, your understanding, and you, it takes time. And that's the wonderful thing and makes us treasure a wonderful whiskey when it arrives even more. So thank you very much, Simon. Thank Speaking you, Camilla. Thanks Bye. a lot. Have a lovely day. Bye-bye. And to listen, she turned her head to hear And the steps became entrusted to her only faulty ear Alex, good morning and thank you for joining us as the Arbike brand ambassador for, uh, for the United States. Um, I'm delighted to be able to catch up and to learn what's been happening with Arbike the last few months. 
Yeah, thanks, Camilla. Thanks for um, firstly for having us on. It's great to be able to share about our Beaky and everything we've been through. It's been a, an exciting journey the last seven years when we opened up the distillery. Well, I think it's the Sterling family and what they have done with their um, family farm uh, for generations to take it forward to being this leading distillery in such a short time is fabulous. So um, can you just give us a little overview of this very large farm and how they came to think this is what we should do? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, you're right. It's a, it's a very exciting time for us, an exciting story. Uh, so basically it's owned by the Sterling family. They've been farming the lands for four generations. Um, and basically the idea to actually build a distillery and put that into the farm, uh, this all came about in New York. Uh, the Sterling brothers, Johnny and David, all with various corporate careers, uh, saw this huge opportunity, the fact that we could actually create a distillery and actually challenge the industry and go with this field to wall process, which is exactly what our beaky is all about. So we, um, we pride ourselves on being single estate. So we grow, we distill, we bottle, we mature all on the one location. So roll back seven years, we, have a, we already have a 2,000 acre farm uh, located on the east coast of Scotland in between our growth and Montrose. Uh, and obviously we have all these amazing ingredients that we can use in all our spirits. But from day one, it's always been about, we've always had that vision to become one of the most sustainable distilleries in the world. And being farmers and farm-based, we have that pride for the land and the environment. So we've always had sustainable as part of our vision and being traceable, tracing back to the exact field to within two centimeters is what we can do, which is amazing. <laughs> um, and also provenance and terroir is, is massive to us as well. Well, what I think has been wonderful is the end goal is to produce whiskey, but that takes time. And so you started with gins and vodkas, but not just gin and vodka. I mean, pepper vodka and all these different types of uh, gins, etc., which have won you huge accolades around the world. You've been really picking up some major awards out the gate. Um, and you also came up with a, a P-Gin, is it? Yeah, that's right. So yeah, I'll talk, tell you about the, the P-Gin. We'll get that out of the way first. Um, so basically this is one of our, our newest products. We actually released it during the lockdown. Um, it's called Nadar, which means Gaelic for nature. Um, and this was actually a five-year project by our master distiller, Kirsty Black, who is a phenomenal talent. Uh, she's a perfectionist in what she does. And we actually collaborated with uh, Abate University and also the James Hutton Institute. So as part of her PhD at university in actually looking at um, making alcohols from legumes. So this is actually pea-based. Um, so what we saw is peas are fantastic for the ecosystem and the crop rotation on the farm. They're also nitrogen fixing, so it removes the need for using uh, nitrogen fertilizers and things like that. Uh, so yeah, it's the world's first climate positive vodka and gin. The gin we get lemongrass and recruit lime that we grow in our polytunnels ourselves, along with things like chili. Obviously, you mentioned we have a, a chipotle chili vodka. We actually grow the, our own chipotle chilies. We smoke them in whiskey barrels. We have a, a fresh strawberry vodka as well. So yeah, we've got it all going on at the distillery. It's really exciting. And you also have some wonderful recipes of, for cocktails that we've been sharing with people, because apart from knowing that you can make a great Bloody Mary if it's got a pepper vodka in it, um, you've got some really, the strawberry uh, vodka and gin cocktails were, were fabulous that you were sharing earlier. Have you got a little booklet or where can people find out about these great ideas? Yeah, so we have like, Kind of our, we call them like some of our perfect serves or twists on classics. So um, the website is, is a great place to source these. But um, what we like to do with cocktails as well is kind of keep it quite seasonal. Like with the strawberry vodka, for example, we, we do that on, obviously it's more of a summer fit for that. So it's perfect for champagne or Prosecco to make a really nice kind of bubbly cocktail. But um, yeah, you mentioned the chili is, is outstanding in a Bloody Mary, but the gins, things like a bee's knees, which is, just honey and fresh lemon is delicious as well. But it's great. The good thing about what we, our portfolio, we have basically a potato range. So we have a potato based vodka. And one important thing is that we create our own base spirit. And that's what makes our Riki very unique is the fact that we don't buy in anything from anywhere else. We actually use the crops that we grow on the farm 
to actually create a flavor profile. And each crop has a different, obviously, characteristics. So we can actually, we have a massive head start in that front because 99.9 9, 9 distilleries in the world, they actually source in something called grain neutral spirit, which is basically a pre-made alcohol, which is totally against what we do. We actually, we basically make the raw ingredients. We, we harvest them and, and we make a raw spirit, a base spirit from scratch. So um, right now, in this short time, you've managed also to get your distribution going in the United States, which you're spearheading with David Sterling. Um, and so at this point, you're available in 33 states. Is that with all the gins and vodkas and, and all yeah, the so which we'll get to in a second? That's right, yeah. So yeah, for, for consumers, um, we have, yeah, we're across about 40 states online. You can get things delivered direct to your door. Um, but for distribution wise, like to bars and restaurants and hotels, um, we're in some of the major states, obviously New York, Connecticut, uh, California, Illinois, and Florida, quite new states for us, but uh, really looking good so far. And we also do a lot of work in uh, the Caribbean in Tux and Caicos as well, which has been a really exciting market for us. Have you been down there yet? Are you looking um, that way, Steve? Been, taking care of that? Yeah, I've been down a few times. Okay. To, to that <laughs> way. I'm glad they're letting you do that. There's um, worse places to be. I know, exactly. Um, so getting back to the whiskey. So, so it's going to take time to get to the fully matured uh, single malt. I think um, you've mentioned in other conversations with me that it's like 18 years. But meantime, you have come out with a Highland Rye. Can you That's right. explain that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so obviously, like we were saying, single malt, we're looking around about 18 years. It could be a little bit earlier, but we don't want to release anything too early. Um, but in the meantime, because of everything we do, we're farm-based, we're innovative. Um, we actually look back around 198 years ago in, the, in how Scotch whiskey used to be made, which is always about farm-based. So this kind of suited us perfect, and we looked in that rye is actually was very prominent and often used for, for making Scotch whiskey. Um, and the reason it's not been done for so long is that rye is a very hard crop to grow. So we obviously being farmers and the expertise on the farm with Kirsty and Christian, our other distiller who's our production manager, we were able to actually challenge ourselves and also challenge the industry and let's grow this ourselves. We've done it with the rest of the line. We've done peas, we've done wheat, we've done potatoes where we have a 2000 acre farm. So, um, Long and behold, in 2018, we released the only Scottish rye whiskey on the planet and the first Scottish rye whiskey in over 150 years using rye, wheat and barley all grown on the Arbiki farm. Uh, the following year, we also did a four-year-old, um, which was aged in charred American oak and finished in uh, Armagnac casks. So the four-year-old we did exclusively to 1,220 bottles. Three-year-old was 998 bottles. And then obviously most recently we've been working on 1794, which is our signature rye, which is um, the year when our beaky was first discovered as a farm distillery, obviously a long time ago. And this is all about the revival of rye whiskey and going back to those basics and the grains that were, we proudly grow on the farm. It's all about being able to actually identify that when you're drinking the whiskey, because we haven't aged this in any other cast. This is, this is aged in new American oak. So absolutely beautiful, amazing with, old fashions on its own with a nice cube of ice, have it neat or something like a Manhattan, it's absolutely beautiful. But yeah, this one, we've been winning a lot of awards with this as well. So, so just in closing, just take a moment to say all the great awards you've been doing. I am absolutely, you know, congratulations. It's been one Thank award you. after another. What are the ones that you're the most proud of? I think the one that really, takes all the boxes for us. It has to be um, excellence and sustainability, which we won at the Scotch Whiskey Awards. Um, it's, it doesn't really get any better than that because from day one, we've always had that, like I said earlier, that vision to be one of the most distil sustainable distilleries in the world. So to win this and for the whole team, all the hard work and to be up against so many big distilleries and distillers, um, without doubt, that's probably the one that really stands out for us. But we also won even with our gin, we won uh, world's best martini competition, which was in London, which was, which again was, and that was using AK's gin, which is 
named after Alexander Kirkwood Sterling, the, the father of the Sterling brothers. So very important gin in the portfolio and to win World's Best Martini was, uh, it was a good night, put it that way. Well, I think, I think that what we need to do is to get featuring a few of your cocktails as we come into spring. Um, once again, that was highly popular on our, um, our bulletins. Um, and so we're really looking forward to keeping up to date on all you're doing. And I'm very excited to know that we now can get hold of the Abeki product so easily in the States. That's fantastic. So we'll share that with everybody. And I yeah. hope I hope in the coming weeks we can catch up again and keep hearing the uh, keep hearing the news. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks again for having us on. It's great to um, tell you what we've been up to in the last little while. Well, say hello to everybody. Thank you so much. You. Bye. Absolutely. Thanks, Camille. Thank you for joining us this week. I hope you've enjoyed this podcast as much as we've enjoyed bringing it to you. Our podcast, The Scots in Us, are released the first and third Mondays of each month on all platforms, including YouTube. And so a very special thank you to our members and friends for all your support. Learn more about us on our website, americanscottishfoundation.org. And to next time, thank you. Your steps are strange, but his dance is still here, cause it's been